Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. And can you hear me? Yes. Good. Yes, Vincent van Gogh, or Van Gogh, as I call him, or basically Vincent. That's the way he wanted to be known, and most of his paintings were signed just Vincent. Uh, has intrigued me for a long time. It's a man who is very complex and to this day still is in the news, um, more than 100 years after his death. From Vincent, I have learned so much about literature, about art, about artists, about the expressive language of art, and about compassion. So um, it's a pl pleasure for me to talk to you about him and to give you some insight into his life. This particular uh, talk will focus on the artist who influenced Vincent and all other kinds of things in his life that were very influential on him. And then um, it will show you how Vincent actually opened the doors to the 20th century artists who began to no longer paint really what they saw, but very often of what they felt. And in the, the lifespan of Vincent, that's the shift that occurred in art. So I will go through his life story. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is this better? I will go through his life story uh, chronologically and touch upon the, the influences that uh, made him the artist he was to become. And so we'll move through that and then into the 20th century artist. To understand Vincent and to understand why he has such an amazing impact on everybody. I mean, school children will know who Vincent van Gogh is. He will know, they will know he painted Starry Night. He, they will know the ear was cut off, uh, all those kinds of things. But he's definitely in the mainstream of people's consciousness, children even. Vincent grew up in a small town, uh, son of a pastor, and there were several influences that were very big. And I tried to put this in this imagery here. The um, print of the prodigal son and the print of the background were prints that hung in the study of his father. And Vincent would have seen those every day. And they made a big influence on him because in those years, imagery was really used to teach truths or concepts. Just like in the book, that children received in schools, and we still have them today, where stories or words and images really meant the same thing. So children learn to read the image and they learn to read the words. And that's how Vincent grew up. He realized that visual images had stories to tell. That's an important part of his influence. And also that he grew up in nature. He was a country boy at heart. He was a lonesome little boy roaming the heath and letting nature sink into his whole body and soul. His sister later would say that nature spoke to Vincent in a thousand voices and his soul listened. And all the things that he soaked up during those early years became part of the vocabulary he used later on when he began to paint. Fairy tales, stories, books, all these things left, image, left uh, tremendous um, memories within him that would resurface throughout his life and really became co uh, companions to his life. Writers, artists, all kinds of things. And nature symbolism was also something he was introduced to by his mother. So a flower wasn't just a flower, it had a meaning. And all of these things came into being in his painting. So he was a man who really learned how to think in an associative way. One thing that he saw would lead to something else and bring something else to mind. And all these types of things would come out in his paintings one day. But before he began to paint, once he left home at the age of 15, the family decided he would become an art dealer. And so he apprenticed for the next 12 years of his life in the cities of Amsterdam, in Den Haag, and in Paris. And these years were um, very productive. Not that he became an art dealer. He rejected that at some point. But he was very much involved in self-educating himself. So whatever he saw, like in the nature, in the, in the early years of his ch uh, childhood, roaming through the heath and uh, past the 
peasants uh, sowing and reaping in the fields around his town, he soaked in what he could see in the cities. Of course, he had to try to sell art, too. But he was more drawn to the artists that were beyond the galleries that he was supposed to be uh, apprenticing in. Those pictures were more scenes of battles, of bygone eras, of myths. He was more intrigued by the reality, by the artists that were doing things differently, that were more connected with life. So on the left hand, you'll see a print. I don't know how well you can see it, but it's taken from one of the periodicals uh, at the time where artists were starting to draw images of the poor, of the marginalized, because they felt as artists, as illustrators, that they could um, provoke or invoke some social change by making people more aware of what is really going on. And Vincent was drawn to that. He was drawn to the poor anyway, because that's where he grew up, in rural Holland, where the peasants were very hardworking and struggling people. He was also influenced by many other things. For example, the prints on the right is a print made by one of those illustrators right after the death of Charles Dickens. He painted or drew the empty chair of Dickens at the desk in the, in the study of Dickens. This chair would come and resurface in Vincent's art later on. It made such an impact on him that a chair could speak of somebody, had a story to tell. So in the galleries, he's trying to learn the uh, art of dealing in art. But he was drawn, as I said, to the museums, to the galleries outside of the place where he was supposed to work. And I'm showing you this image because this is the art that was prevalent at the time. These were the salon artists. In order to be accepted in a Paris salon, you had to paint according to formal traditions, according to what the Academy of Art prescribed. And this was the art that was in at the time. And this is just a few years before the Impressionists hit the scene, before Vincent comes along. So we're still steeped in the real formal. Art is good if it looks like what you're looking at, if, you're, if you can represent it as like it is. Whereas the shift was starting to happen where you were beginning to paint more what was invisible to the eye, more conceptual. Vincent was very much taken by some of the artists. One of them is Delacroix. And whenever you see an image that is surrounded by a red frame, that would be an artist who had a major influence on Vincent. Delacroix was a romantic artist who used colors suggestively already at that time. And he also deviated a little bit from the formal uh, traditional art. So Delacroix stayed with Vincent all of his life. What Vincent really was attracted to were the artists who painted what he saw outside in nature. So then the realist artists, the nature artist, Constable and Corot, painted nature the way Vincent could feel it. He would often say, I walked through a, uh, a cloudy sky just like Constable painted. So he connected with these artists a lot more than with the art he was supposed to sell. These were not artists that were selling in the Goupil galleries where he was working. He um, was also very much drawn again to the artists who depicted the poor, the marginalized, the peasants, the people who were working hard to make a living and to provide a living for the rest of the world. So these were the artists that he was drawn to. And as he learned more and more about the importance of art to be a relevant communicator, of modern things, of things that were important in his day and age, he began to be more and more disillusioned with what he had to do in the art gallery of Goupil, of the company. And um, he began to actually neglect his work. But before I go to the next step, I wanted to show you a very important incident in Vincent's life, without which there would not have been a Vincent van Gogh. Vincent is still an art dealer apprentice. He has no idea yet that he will be an artist one day. He does meet with his four years younger brother, Theo, when he's working in The Hague. And the, four, the two boys go for a walk together. And it's during that walk where they um, pledge to each other to be loyal, to be friends, to bear their souls to each other. From that moment on, these two uh, boys were soulmates, more than brothers. And eventually, they became probably the most influential and important art um, partnership that the world has ever known. Because without Theo, there would not have been a Vincent.
And Theo uh, was recognized by Vincent years later when he had started to paint because he said in a letter to Theo, at present, I do not think my picture's worthy of the advantages I have received of you, because Theo was going to be paying for him for the rest of his life. But once my paintings are worthy, I swear that you will have created them as much as I, and that we are making them together. So I wanted you to be fully aware that Theo is there all the way now from this moment on. As I said, Vincent had become disillusioned with the art he was supposed to sell. And he's writing many, many letters. So that correspondence between Theo and Vincent will last from this moment of the, of the walk to Reiswijk to the end of their lives. And there will be 60, 651 letters between the two uh, brothers. So this is an example of one of the letters. But during this time, when he became disillusioned, he started to uh, question what he was supposed to do. He was unhappy. He was depressed for a long, long time. And he turned to the one source of comfort that he knew, which was religion. He had grown up with religion. He had grown up listening to parables and to the comforting words of the Bible. So he began to read the Bible fervently. He began to read other religious books. And he um, took all of those things in. Again, nothing that Vincent ever did didn't leave a, a mark on him, on his soul. It changed his life. So one of the um, quotes from Thomas Carlyle, a philosopher, with, is this one, which again sunk deep into Vincent's soul. Carlyle said, through every star, through every blade of grass, is not God made visible? if we will open our minds and eyes. That was a sentence he took in. And that was a sentence that would propel him one day to make those stars, the grass, the flowers visible to us so that we could see the creative power at work. So this was a very influential time. But it was also time when he um, struggled and was eventually dismissed by the Gukil Galleries. This was the first failure he experienced. And he wandered from this moment on a few years from job to job, from place to place. He became an art teacher, or a curate, rather, an assistant, assistant curate. He became a book dealer. He then decided that he would probably do best if he became a pastor like his father and tried to study theology. But he failed because he couldn't learn Hebrew and Latin. And he didn't understand why he needed to do those languages anyway. He did come in touch with um, the poor in a, in a little place um, where he encountered miners going in and out of um, this little building you can see on the right, bringing coal. And he looked at those men uh, and realized that these were the people that really needed to hear the light of the gospel. So the fact that he wanted to become a pastor like his father did sink in and did compel him then to not give up on becoming a pastor, but changing to the, more, the, the easier way uh, of becoming a missionary. And he went to missionary school, but he failed there too. He just had different ideas on how to do things, and how to minister, and how to bring the light of the gospel as he writes. And all through this time, he writes to Theo. He quotes uh, scripture passages. He's fervent about the, the vocation he thinks he has found. He fails missionary school, but he is determined to go to the darkest place where he could really try to bring that faith that he had to people that really he felt needed it most. So he does go into the mining village in the Borinage, the most desolate place in Belgium. The two paintings you see are painted by an artist who was in the same place five years after Vincent was there and really painted exactly the, the kind of um, d dismal state that the miners were in. And Vincent saw those paintings, and he said they, that they moved him. But at this point, he's there, and he's, be, he's given an, actually a probationary period of six months by that missionary society. They thought, well, we'll try one more time. And he did fine for a while. But when he realized that preaching the gospel to men and women who were so 
starve for sunlight, for food, for n nutritional things and healthy things, he realized that wasn't going to give him the light of the gospel that he felt he should give them. So he began to uh, do practical work. He gave up the preaching. He gave away his, his uh, preferred status as a missionary, shared his clothing, shared the bed linens for bandages, and so on. He went right into where he believed Jesus would have wanted him to be, right on the level with the poor. In order to love them, in order to care for them, he had to live with them and understand their plight. So this is where he was found six months after he was given the probationary um, period. And the missionary society could barely recognize him and realize this missionary wasn't really fulfilling the way they felt he should do it. And they dismissed him. And they cited that he um, had a lack of oratory skills, whereas we know he spoke French fluently at that, at that time in his life. So this is the place, though, where um, thankfully for us, Vincent realized if oratory quality wasn't what he had, that he needed to find a new language. And it's in the Borinage, in this really dark, dismal place where he now was dismissed by the, by the church institution, almost given up by his family for not doing the proper, beautiful thing. And uh, this is where he hit rock bottom. And this is where those little sketches you saw in his letters started to gain more importance. And all the lessons he had learned throughout the years of studying art and looking at artists, he realized he could use a language just like Rembrandt did to preach the gospel. Rembrandt painted parables. He painted biblical stories. Vincent said, I can reach people that way too. Because that, that urge to draw did bubble up through all that misery that he was in, in the Borinage. And the other artists that he absolutely felt did the right thing to paint the poor, to, to uplift the sowers, the peasants, the gleaners into the eye of the, of the general public. Millet was another one of his examples. So in that moment of desperation where he really thought he didn't know how to get out of his misery, he decided to become an artist. And this is the moment in here. It was his first transformation. But he still had not given up the desire to be a pastor. So those were two strong, uh, compelling feelings he had. He wanted to preach or be a pastor, bring light to those in need, help those in need, and to learn the, the, the art language. He did leave the Borinage because he was sick and, and totally poor, and went back to his parents for a brief period where he began to study um, and self-educate himself by drawing the peasants around the little rural town that his parents were living in. After a brief stay with them, he did move to Den Haag again, where Theo set him up in a little studio apartment. And this is where Vincent really uh, began to uh, seriously realize that he was an artist, that he wanted to be part of the art community in The Hague. And he um, was excited by the fact that he had a place where he could invite models. And since he had very little money, the models came from the soup kitchens and the almshouses. And they were the types of people he had seen in the periodicals where the illustrators had lifted up the poor to, uh, to, make, to invoke social change. So on the left-hand side, the, the red framed image is a, uh, an image of poor huddled together in front of a soup kitchen. Vincent emulated that in a later painting. And the painting itself is composed of the many, many models that would come into his studio that he drew. And then he composed them together in that uh, image of the, of the uh, people standing in front of a soup kitchen or at the lottery, I think. This was the lottery. But Vincent's desire to minister found fulfillment in The Hague because these poor came for a few coins for a little time of respite, sitting in a little apartment that was relatively warm, and he would give them some food, and he would communicate with them, and he would have a, a contact with them on a deeper level. He identified with them. And so when he drew them, he drew himself too, in a way. And he also thought and knew that this was a type of art that was truly modern. It was showing reality 
in its true form. That desire to help others and to, to save souls that were desperate led him eventually not just to draw, but also to save a poor woman called Sin, a prostitute. And he took her into his apartment and hoped that through his own example of living, he could change her, could help her get out of the predicament she was in. So again, it was that close um, solidarity, like with the miners, now with this woman, Asin, who became his prime model. But he's still influenced also by all these artists that he had seen for, for several years in the galleries. Chardin and Israel's a Dutch artist. The poses that he had seen sit in were poses that he had seen in other people's art. And he, and he knew that they were um, identifiable poses. They were, people could identify with these types of images. And Sin, of course, was real to him. And on the right-hand side is um, one of the most famous drawings he did at this time, where he really is able, and this is showing you how much practicing he had done with a simple contour line to draw the outline of a woman. It's no longer just seen. In this wonderful example, he is showing a universal uh, feeling of sorrow, and he calls it sorrow. He's able to use a body and express something more, something universal. And he also says that um, rendering the reality of what he sees, it becomes symbolic. He doesn't make it up. He simplifies, maybe. He exaggerates, maybe. But the, the actual reality of this predicament of scene, of the sorrow she feels, of the misery she feels, he's able to express in a simple line. He writes then to one of his um, friends, I don't think this was to Theo, reality has to, um, can be symbolic, but that reality must involve the artist totally. It must be deeply felt until the thing has shaped itself in my mind. Until, Vincent says, I feel I know a subject. I don't think I could have painted or drawn sorrow had I not felt it myself. So Vincent here is, is entering into a, uh, an array of expressing art that is very new, that wasn't happening yet. Artists were still painting what others wanted them to paint. They painted what the rules said they should paint. Vincent is deviating. He has come from that very dark, lonely place where he really discovered his vocation and also the fact that art could be a powerful tool to communicate. Vincent spent quite a long time with Sin. He tried to help her. She wouldn't, uh, wasn't able to, through pressure of her family, to leave the, the way of life. So he realized he had to leave her behind and escaped, escaped to a very dismal area in the north of Holland called Drenthe. But in Drenthe, he knew one of his very um, favorite artists, Daubigny, had lived too for a while. And he had seen the paintings Daubigny had painted. And here he was seeing the same landscape. And so again, was influenced by the love and understanding of that artist to paint his own misery in that, you know, landscape that was almost a mirror of the way he felt. But this now is also another crucial moment in Vincent's life. This is where the, the full transition happened into living just for art's sake. He would never again take anybody in or give his last shirt. He would always be generous with what he had, but he didn't feel that he needed to save people. He realized that his art was going to have to speak and do that for him. After Drenthe, there were three months that he was there only. He returned back to his parents, and he's 30 years old. So the Vincent we know in his colorful paintings from this time on had only seven more years to paint. With his parents in this little town of Noonan, he decided that what he wanted to be was a, a, a painter of, of uh, the rural landscape of the peasants, of whatever was 
part of the cycles of life in nature. He was determined to be a landscape painter. And, uh, and he painted and drew and, again, was influenced by other artists. A tree would remind him of a painting he had seen by Gainsborough, for example. And he tried to emulate and create images that were speaking about the tree, not just showing a tree, but showing the tree, the character of a tree. He used that kind of um, intensity to show the character of things or the soul. He would often say a painting has to have soul in order to be meaningful. He applied that to also the figure drawing. That was his first love, was to anyway draw people, draw their plight, draw their value, draw what they were doing and contributing to society. Again, influenced by his favorite artist or one of his favorite artists, Millet. Millet was a realist painter, but Vincent went a step further. When he saw the, the peasants, and now he's beginning to actually use paint, he wanted them to really look like they were digging in the soil. He didn't paint romanticized versions of peasants, which we can see in many of the artworks. He really wanted them to be showing us that they were working hard. One must paint the peasants as being one of them, as feeling, thinking as they do. They have to be, these paintings have to be honest, have to really talk about labor. So there is one of the, the paintings he did. He also painted the weavers, many, many images of weavers trapped in their cottages behind the weaving loom, showing to the, wanting to show to the outside world, this is where your cloth comes from. Be mindful that these people have value. He also, during this time with his parents, went to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and was introduced or, again, saw uh, paintings by Franz Hals who was a 17th century artist, but had been very successful with his painting style, which was loose and spontaneous to breathe life into portraits. And this one is called Male Babe, and it, she is a, a, a simple woman who is not embellished. She's shown the way she is, the character of her, and she's very much alive. And that was another thing that Vincent then took back with him when he continued to paint. He wanted his portraits to speak of the life of the people. And he learned how to loosen up his brush strokes, to leave things a little bit unfinished, because that really actually made it more lifelike. Anything that was completely finished with all the details, glossed and everything, became sort of static, didn't move. But an unfinished type of painting tile, style could actually move you, could make you be part of the, the painting process. So he wanted to create um, a masterpiece. He actually had that in mind. And we all, most of us are probably familiar with the painting that these uh, portraits are meant to be a part of. He painted 50 portraits before he actually then put them together in the painting called The Potato Eaters. And most of us are, I think, familiar with this one. And it is his Dutch masterpiece. And it's a painting that is taken directly from the smoky hut of the potato eaters. That's where he sat when he painted it. Rembrandt is still one of his uh, examples because he paints um, Isaac being visited by angels around a table. This is around the table image where a lot of life happens. It's like a communion almost. Israel is another artist who painted several images of peasants sitting around the table, a very holy moment. But notice how different the style of painting is with Vincent. He's not embellishing anything. He actually is exaggerating the features to make them look worn out, which they were, the people were. And he said, art does not have to be beautiful. It has to be real. So I don't care if you don't think this is a beautiful painting. But it's honest. And that was more important for Vincent, that it would be an honest image. While Vincent is still in Noonan, um, he is now around 32 years old, his father dies. And because they live in a parsonage with the death of the pastor, the family had to move out. So Vincent had no place to go. His mother found a place with, with one of his sisters. Well, it was time for him to move on again. And this time he decided he would go to Paris. Because in the meantime, his 
younger brother Theo had actually done what his family wanted Vincent to do. He became an art dealer. And that is how Theo then made his money. He became an art dealer of the Impressionist artists in Paris. So now Vincent, with his masterpiece of the potato eaters, was ready to go to the art world or the art center. And he arrived in Paris, and one of the first um, portraits he made of himself was to make himself look a dapper Parisian artist. He wasn't that way yet, and he never was going to be. But he wanted to be part of that world, the art world. And in Paris, it was a greenhouse for him of learning many new things. First of all, colors. <laughs> he didn't, didn't have the colors the Impressionists already had, the synthetic colors, the colors in paint tubes so that the Impressionist artists could actually go outside and paint outside and not in the studios anymore. So he had already understood with Delacroix and Franz Hals the power that, that, that color did have to express something. But now he had a whole new palette with which he could experiment. And it was a time of experimentation. He was with Theo for two years. He also learned about composition by, uh, from the Japanese artists. And I'll show you some images a little bit later. Japanese art was extremely popular and probably one of the largest or biggest influences on the Impressionist artists. Japanese artists lose, use bright colors. They um, it made images of the everyday transient world of, of everyday images. And the, the Impressionist artists took those to heart and began to, as I say, go outside and paint life in the streets of Paris and the parks. And there you have, of course, Monet and Renoir, who at that time were uh, in Paris influencing the whole world of, of art and breaking away from the strict rules of the French Academy. It was a very exciting time to be in Paris. But I don't know if anyone has heard of this artist called Alphonse Monticelli. Anybody heard of him? He was truly the greatest influence on Vincent during his years in Paris. Monticelli's artwork is on the top and on the left. He had painted in um, the 1850s in Paris for a while. He came from the south of France, but he was uh, trying his hand in Paris. And he began to paint in a style that not even the Impressionists use. Thick paint that caught the light, that reflected the light. Uh, brush strokes, you know, loaded with, with texture, textured paint. And just very, very different from the Impressionists. That the Impressionists were light and, and you know, um, didn't have that heaviness. Monticelli wanted more substance in his work. But when he was criticized for painting in a sloppy kind of way, the way it was, Monticelli remarked, which I th think kind of profound, he said, I'm painting this way to be understood 30 years from now. And 30 years later, Vincent stood in front of Monticelli's paintings. And Monticelli, like Vincent, was also very taken with the artist de la Croix, who used color in such a very expressive and suggestive way. So he already there felt a link between Monticelli. And he actually wrote to Theo, I sometimes think I am really continuing that man. So he took Monticelli and he went further. And that is something I didn't see in too many art books. But from the letters, when you read Vincent's letters, all these kinds of things come out at you. I'm going to show you this image here because I just wanted to point out the incredible change in his art in those two years in Paris. Seurat is the background with his dappling colors, making the colors kind of come together and your eye sort of mixes them. And the bottom left hand uh, painting that Vincent did in Holland still, or actually maybe did that in France very early on with the dark colors of Holland. What a change, what a shift. It's an amazing, uh, amazing transformation for Vincent. But two years in Paris were too much for Vincent. He was not really that dapper artist that he tried to look like in the beginning. He really was a country boy at heart and more a peasant painter. And so this is a portrait he painted just before leaving Paris with his peasant smock on, but showing the new palette of colors that he gained from being in Paris. And with him, as he got on the train to go south, he took the three most influential artists with him in his, in his mind. Monticelli, 
who had also returned to the south of France after he left Paris. The Japanese, the composition, the strong colors, the everyday, ordinary moments, and of course, Delacroix, who really taught him how to use color. So he drove south nine hours on a train, and he gets off in the little town of Arles, where he hoped to create an artist community. He also called it the Japan, the Japan of the South, because he felt that the sunlight in the south of France brought the colors out more. And he could paint more like the Japanese in terms of the intensity of his coloring. In um, Arles, he finally found a little house called the Yellow House. It's in the middle with the green shutters. And this is the house he hoped to become an artist studio. And this is where he painted those famous sunflowers. And he painted them to decorate the house in preparation for the artist who would come to be with him. And the only artist who actually did was Gauguin. So these are actually flowers that he painted for Gauguin. Sunflowers, uh, meaning uh, symbolism is gratitude. So there is a, there's a wonderful feeling about those sunflowers. He um, was drawn not to the ancient Roman ruins of Arles, but to the nature, to the blooming orchards, to the wheat fields. And we're now beginning to see the style that Vincent is known for. He wanted to wrestle with nature in order to find and uh, discover the secret. And what he decided to, the secret was is that the ordinary things that you see, the temporal things point to the eternal things, point to the lasting things. A tree is a symbol of, um, transient, the, the blooms will fade away, but that eternal blooming all the time, it, it's an eternal happening. It's a cycle of life. So these trees became almost symbols for that, for the eternal in the temporal. So here are the wheat fields that he painted. Never having forgotten that print he saw in his father's study of a wheat field, of a funerary procession through the wheat field, the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of a human soul. Wheat or cornfields for him always symbolized humanity. The sowing of the seeds, the growing, and then being harvested. So it always, there's more to Vincent's paintings than meets the eye at first. He hopes to touch us by some of the eternal truths in what he paints. Of course, he's known for his sower, which becomes like a Rembrandt almost, a parable in paint. You have the, the sowing of the seed, and the sower, of course, is uh, modeled on Millet's sower, the eternal um, sower moving through and, and reanimating uh, the earth. And so this, this imagery here is of the beginnings of the seed, of being sown. But in the background, you see already the band of ripe corn under the brilliant sun which was the source of all life, which for him symbolized the divine. So you have a parable of the cycle of life in this one painting, a very conceptual piece of art. It's real, it's reality, and yet it's also conceptual. Vincent, no matter where he was, always brought art with him. In his mind, he had prints too, but he also remembered art. And I'm bringing Rembrandt in here again. Because like Millet, Rembrandt inspired Vincent to do many types of paintings. And the painting that this imagery inspired Vincent to do was a portrait of one of his friends in Arles, Madame Roulin. This is the holy family. Rembrandt took an ordinary family. The grandmother is sitting, pulling a rope, and rocking the, babe, the Christ child, or the baby Jesus. You can see the rope in her hands. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, is sitting and reading a book. So it's an ordinary moment in an ordinary family, yet at the same time, it's a sacred story. Vincent looked at life that way. He would look at a mother rocking her child as a holy family. So Madame Roulin called the, the cradle rocker, and not everybody will realize why she's holding a rope in her hand, but she's pulling the cradle of a child. This is a painting that um, is done in the time that Gauguin was actually with Vincent in Arles. And we can see a little bit of Gauguin's influence here because Gauguin painted with flat colors, larger areas. 
without shade and without um, modulate, modeling the, the areas. So Vincent is a little bit touched by what Gauguin is doing, even though he doesn't agree with the way Gauguin paints. Here is another image uh, of a Gauguin-inspired sewer. And I'm showing you this one because in this painting, many influences actually come together. Gauguin's colors, flat colors, um, Delacroix's favorite color combination was this Prussian blue and citron yellow. So Delacroix is in this painting too. Also the Japanese style of uh, composition is there. And of course, the parable of the sower. It's all tied in together and it's a beautiful painting and a very powerful one. One of the um, images here is also another way to show Gauguin's difference uh, to Vincent. They both painted the Les Alicans, the, the necro necropolis in all. Gauguin became a symbolist. He actually painted more from memory and wanted to um, highlight the mystical and the visionary in his painting. So you almost see on the top there in, in Gauguin's um, uh, sort of a temple, more of a mystical place. There was a temple. It wasn't necessarily situated like that. It was situated where Vincent painted it, earthy, part of life. It's not mystical, it is sacred, it's real. Gauguin was more into the visionary and the symbolic um, quality in his paintings. But the painting that uh, I think really shows the two diverging is this one here, the Red Vineyard, painted from memory. Gauguin insisted that Vincent would paint things from memory that, that he could paint more and deeper and, and more meaningfully. Vincent and Gauguin had seen the, the grape harvest in Arles, went back to the little yellow house and painted. Vincent painted an ode to joy, the, the glorious uh, colors of the grape harvest, the peasants with their blue smocks, that wonderful blue-orange um, complementary color, the brilliant sun that is sort of animating everything. And Gauguin painted Human misery, he calls it, la uh, misère humaine, the hard work of the peasants. It was more an ode to misery rather than an ode to joy. They were very different. And um, at this point in, the, in the, this stage of them being together, they began to disagree so ve vehemently and um, violently at times that Gauguin said, I can't take it anymore, and he left, he threatened to leave, and the threat of leaving Vincent alone in Arles and you know, shattering the dream of having an artist colony really was the instigation for that ear incident and that put Vincent in the hospital then. And that changed things for him. He never could um, recover fully. He began to have recurring seizures. And uh, Arl was, that time in Arl, the only the year he spent in Arl was finished. He had to leave. He had to find a place that would take him in because he knew that his health had suffered and that he had the most likely re recurring uh, seizures. So he signed himself into a asylum uh, in Saint-Rémy. This is the place where he painted for a year and some of the most incredible paintings came. He again painted the wheat fields that he saw from the, behind the bars of his window. So you have four wheat fields. From the beginning, the green wheat to the ripe wheat, he saw the whole cycle of life again. And this is also the place where he would paint Starry Night. So in this asylum, he created some of the most powerful, very subjective paintings. This one, the irises is known for too. This was created in the inner garden of the asylum. Vincent comes face to face with the flowers. He is now beginning to paint, not just because he wants you and me to see his work and to see every blade of grass and flower, but he's beginning to paint out of his own need to be comforted. And he is comforted by communicating with these flowers and also bringing into his mind the Japanese um, Zen way of looking at things. Basho, a Zen artist or a Zen poet had said, if you want to paint the bamboo or an iris, you have to become the bamboo. You have to become the iris. And Vincent had already been doing that with the sunflowers and here with the irises. And of course, the uh, painting by Hokusai is a, one that he understood and knew and emulated in his work. 
after a year in Saint-Rémy, and his seizures not getting better, uh, he painted between them. He uh, painted for his own salvation then. Uh, Theo wanted him to return north to be closer to him. And he goes to a little town called Auvers, not far from Paris. And he almost comes full circle. He's back with the thatched cottages that he was used to in Holland. And I put the uh, left hand image there to show you that's how he painted before he went to the south of France. And what a difference. His paintings are now charged with emotion, charged with, um, with uh, the energy that he sees in everything. He, he, he feels what he sees, and he tries to put that in his lines and in his colors. So he exaggerates. He um, uh, puts more uh, colors in places to evoke more emotions and to satisfy his own need for that, too. He also painted this famous picture. And most of us know it because it's one of the pic paintings that sold very for very much money. Um, Dr. Gasha, who was the, uh, the doctor that treated him in Auvergne. <laughs> and this is another painting that shows all, all the influences that he was exposed to. He was, again, exposed, of course, to Delacroix, had seen that uh, painting of the, the poet Tasso in prison. In the stance of melancholy, Tasso was a very melancholic man. And he probably, Vincent, probably had the print of this painting, which have been reversed. So if you look at Gachet and you look at Tasso in that Delacroix painting, they almost have the same stance. And what Vincent wanted to do was to exhibit the fact that Gachet himself wasn't a very well man. He suffered from melancholy and depression and also needed sort of somehow somebody to help him get better. So Vincent is using all these images. Durer was one of them to, to express feelings, express moods, not just a, a person. He's also coming into a place where that artist he saw in Drenthe early on, the <coughs> landscape artist, Daubigny, also settled in Arles. And the right-hand bottom painting is the last painting Vincent worked on. And again, emulating the, the imagery that he so well uh, responded to by these artists. And while he was um, painting in the wheat fields, in the cornfields, one day, 70 days after he arrived in Auvergne, he was shot and wounded and died two days later and is now buried in Auvergne in a cemetery surrounded by the cornfield. Theo died six months after him. And they both are there and uh, next to each other with the gravestones. I have a few more slides. I'm running maybe a little bit over. But I wanted to now move a little bit into the ways that Vincent influenced 20th century artists. Because basically, Vincent, as well as the artist Cezanne, whom Vincent tried to emulate also, were the, considered or are considered the fathers of modern art. Both of these artists opened up the gateways for all these isms of the 20th century to happen. Cubism, minimalism, fauvism. Vincent opened it up for the more expressive quality of art, whereas Cezanne opened it up for the more geometric design, the solidity, uh, the substance. Both of them did not want to paint the fleeting impressions the way impressionists had done. They wanted to have more solidifying uh, it, quality in their work. So there you see um, Cezanne and Vincent's work in the background has that almost geometric quality to it, that architectural quality to it, bold colors like Cezanne did. And then from Cezanne, Picasso actually was influenced into becoming the, the Cubist artist and really breaking away from art as it was known. It was a big, big breakthrough. And Vincent. Um, with his work, influenced many artists to also deviate from the norm and to maybe just focus, as in this one, on certain things, on a, on a tree, for example, and to um, s s try to find the actual character of the tree. And that's what Mondrian did with his wonderful um, abstractions. But Vincent already had started that. He had looked at a tree and said, this tree has to speak about being a tree. And Mondrian went a little bit further than that. And here we have Henri Matisse, also influenced by Vincent's. The use of color, 
the use of um, ordinary moment, some decorativeness there. Again, a solid statement of, of a, a life, a, a slice of life. Matisse obeyed visual truths, but he also stylized, exaggerated, just to make a greater impact on the, on the observer. Portraits. Vincent ma painted many, many portraits. In the beginning, it was his likeness. It was intended to show the way he wanted to look. Or, but eventually, he also became more symbolic. And it was more about expressing the mood or the character of the person, not necessarily about his likeness. So on the left, you have him um, painted as um, a Japanese bonze, a, a, a Buddhist monk, really. Because that's what he felt that he was in many ways. That's how he was um, working and doing his art. And Picasso, too, created moods with his blue period, for example. So it wasn't just about the likeness of a person. Edward Monk, also influenced by, by Vincent's ability to create an image on the left-hand corner of a brothel. It's not the brothel that's important. It's the fact that it has a certain mood and a certain sort of sense of place. And that's what Monk did in his, um, in his image here, which is um, people playing the cards in a casino. The same kind of sense of not nice, not a place you really may want to be. That's what they wanted to express. Very expressive. And that's where Vincent really was the, um, the seed, or his art became the seed for expression in art, personal expression to be important. One of my favorite paintings of Vincent, which I feel is so um, much an image of what he went through, is this one. It's a gorge in, um, in the Saint-Rémy, in the south of France, Les Péroulets. You see barely two people struggling through the gorge, right there. He painted this as he was feeling a seizure coming on. And for him, a seizure meant that he went into some hole, some place where he could hardly come out of, and that it was a struggle to get out of that um, physical and emotional uh, and spiritual struggle, to get out of that place where he was in the seizure. And so he's painting his own experience. But the gorge is true, too. He saw that gorge, and he identified with that place and the struggle. And if you look at the lines, they're charged. The colors, they, they almost Wagnerian in, in the drama. So this kind of expressive painting had been seen. Uh, Vincent's art, 10 to 12, 20 years after his death, had arrived on the world, uh, in, in the world's um, arena. There was the Armory Show in New York where Vincent's paintings had been exhibited. So other artists began to see Vincent's art and realize the power of his lines and his colors and began to emulate that. So one of the artists that I combine with this painting of Vincent is uh, Oskar Kokoschka, who was a, a very um, famous expressionist artist. And here he is painting his own experience of his love affair. And it's, uh, he calls it uh, the tempest, the bride of the wind. It's full of emotion, not necessarily um, happy feelings. It was an illicit affair. It was tempestuous. It didn't last. But, but uh, Kokoschka put all of that into this painting. And you could kind of, even if you didn't know the circumstances, you almost get that sense of struggle, of not, you know, the happy ending is not going to happen with this one. <laughs> Vincent also uh, loved to draw, not just paint. Many of his paintings ha have equals in line drawings. And if you look at this, I don't know if anyone can recognize what he was drawing. It's hard to see. Lots of lines. Incredibly busy. Um, it's the little Alps of the south of France, the Alpil. And they're exaggerated. And in the foreground, the gnarled tree trunks of olive trees. It's hard to tell. It almost is an abstract paint in the drawing. It's almost not necessary to know what it is. 
because you're drawn kind of to the lines and the, and the swirls and the movement. It's so full of energy. And lines do have a psychology. Lines do mean something. Lines do express things. On an unconscious level, we, feel we, we are exposed to that. And one of the artists who really became the first artist to not have anything concrete or rec recognizable in his work was Kandinsky. Kandinsky actually said this, and this is, I thought, a, a good quote, and I'm almost done. But he talks about abstract art, because he knew that it would be hard for people who were used to seeing an object in a painting and recognizing it. He knew it would be difficult to understand his art. But he said, abstract art isn't simply a lack of realism. You may come to think of it as a melody, a song, a piece of beautiful music. In music, there is no concrete object to attach ourselves to. In music, we vibrate with the sounds. In art, we vibrate with the colors. So we can let go of needing to understand something and just go with those vibrations of the colors. And Vincent also said at, at this, uh, in the, towards the end of his life that he wanted to make paintings that were comforting, like music is comforting. So he understood the vibrations of sounds and colors they shared. Another pen and ink drawing, and I, I'm putting this one here because um, it is, if you, if you try to imagine him drawing this, this is a garden, we can almost recognize it, full of flowers, and he painted it too, so we know uh, the, uh, the equivalent in paint. But just to imagine him drawing all these shapes, he had to be in it, he had to be completely absorbed by it. And which artist does this remind you of who became very part of his art and part of his painting? Anybody? A modern artist of the abstract uh, American paintings? Yeah. He too was in his paint. It was physical almost. I mean, for Pollock for sure. Another one where Vincent painted grass, lines only. We can almost tell it's grass, but not necessarily. Artists like a Cy Twombly just did lines. Not necessarily grass, we don't know what he thought. But Vincent opened up the possibility to just do something simple like that. Simple, expressive. He loved nature, so grass was something that was important to him. Another one of Vincent's um, in-your-face art were these sunflowers. They are big. That's all there is on the painting. And many artists at that time drew still lifes with vases. But he focused on a dead sunflower, two dead sunflowers, just to make you look. And the artist that comes to mind is a George O'Keefe, who makes you go into the art. The art is in your face. The nature is right there. Art and life become completely com connected. Another painting by Vincent. Ordinary shoes. At that time when he was painting it, that was unheard of to paint a pair of shoes. Work shoes, dirty. <laughs> but artists in the 20th century took those kinds of ideas. This is an artist who created clay models of shoes of immigrant children. It's a conceptual thing. It's supposed to move you, to make you think of something else. An artist like a David Hockney actually did copy Vincent. The wheat field and the chair that he, Vincent, remembers seeing in that print of Dickens's chair. So Hockney took Vincent's ideas and made them his own. Vincent said this about the future of artists, that he felt at some point color would be the most important thing in a painting, that the future artist would be a colorist. And it did happen. In the mid um, 20th century, Mark Rotko, if you're familiar with his work, they're very large and just colors. And it moves people to tears. They're very powerful statements. And so this is what uh, Vincent f foreshadowed some of these things, opened up the um, amazing possibilities for artists to use 
just the pure language of art. The last slide is this one. Just because. <laughs> and I just sometimes wonder, what is it that made this so incredibly famous and so incredibly well known? Is it what one doesn't know? He, he painted this from memory. He painted it in the asylum. And it is a lasting image or a lasting gift to all of us. So this is what I want to leave you with. Thank you for coming and listening.